you know, starting from a young age uh, for you, right? What are major life events that happen you feel like that have contributed to propelling you towards you know, entrepreneurship and uh, to become who you are? So entrepreneurship wasn't really yeah. uh, something that I did from a, oh, I want this and I think entrepreneurship, like I've actually, mm -hmm. believe it or not, I, I never believed entrepreneurship has anything to do with business. Okay. And this is something that I'm very different with, with a lot of people that talk oh, yeah. about entrepreneurship is about, you know, like either like starting your own business or being innovative or mm -hmm. creating. And I don't necessarily agree with that. So entrepreneurship as a whole was never like a driver for me. Okay. The, the, the first driver in my life was poverty. Okay. I hated being poor. So like, were you guys like we, we were very poor? Like okay. me and my mom came like we were rich in Iran. We came to France, built okay. a, a very modest life, starting with zero again. Okay. Ten years, we just basically built a normal life, like normal day to day for my mom. Why did you guys transition? Well, because she always wanted to come to America, and okay. they wouldn't let her at the time. And oh, the revolution started, so yeah. she basically she worked for the government. The revolution started. She had to mm. flee. We went to France. We had nothing, so we went back to zero. My okay. dad abandoned us. Never gave her her own money. That he was there in mm. Iran was like, oh, I'll stay behind. I'll solve everything, and you guys go and I'll send you your own money, her own mm. money, her own house, and everything. Was, never send it. Okay. So basically, we went back to we went to France with the hope of, hey, this is a temporary crap situation. You yeah, know, yeah. we'll be like okay again. And we weren't. So my mom started working again. Years, 10 years later, she built a small business. Mm -hmm. We had enough for basically a car, an apartment, mm. and just survival shit, right? And that was okay. You know, I was a child that didn't know better. You know, mm. always lived within limitations. Nothing wrong with that. And then yeah. from there, finally got a chance to come to America uh, on a visa, on a tourist visa. But she was like, we're going. She's yeah. like, I'm not, I'm not coming back. She's like, I'm <laughs> leaving. And she's like, I'm leaving all my stuff behind. And she goes, I'll yeah. tell my brother to sell the business. Give me some money so we can start mm -hmm. in America. And guess what? No money again. So start again, second time from scratch. Mm. And this time, uh, we don't have a green card. You know, we're not here like legally, so she can't like start a business and do these right. things. So she's just like, hey, what do I do? She goes to work for my uncle as a cashier. So a woman mm. that was head of import export of all weapon systems in a country mm. is now working as a cashier for five dollars an hour. You know, and my mom's Humbling. a lot of that energy, which made me yeah. like see that she was really down and hurt. You know, from like she was yeah, just yeah. beat down, right? Mm -hmm. like, it's like 15 years later, you know, and you still yeah. don't have like the capacity. So you can see that, but she still went for it. Mm. And we lived in my uncle's basement. Uh, and, you know, one day I kept seeing these kids. We lived in a good neighborhood because he lived oh. in a good neighborhood, mm -hmm. but I was in the basement and I kept seeing these kids go to school and Camaros and things like that. And mm -hmm. I'm like, they're just rich, you know? And I was like, I don't know what that's like. And I, and I stopped that day. I remember I just stopped caring mm -hmm. about wanting someone to rescue me. Mm. You know, I just said, like, I don't care who's going to come. Like, my mom's not going to rescue me. My rich uncle's not going to rescue me. No mm. one's going to rescue me. Meaning no one's going to get me it. from poverty to wealth. Mm -hmm. So I got to figure out, like, what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. and, and that day, I remember, I just went and I would ask the neighbors if they wanted me to mow their lawn, clean their cars, whatever. I was like, I don't care, a dollar car. Mm. I'll wash the car for a dollar. Because I thought to myself, I said, it's better to have a dollar than no dollar. I didn't think like, what is my worth? Like today, these kids are like, they're retarded. They think they're like, well, you know, the average rate for... Like, no. why, do, why do you deserve I, that? I was, I was a child that, that was worth zero. Meaning if I stayed yeah. at home, my time was worth zero. So if I mm -hmm. earned 10 cents, a dollar is better than zero. And if I was good at earning a dollar, then I would learn how to earn $3. You right. know, so I eventually went to McDonald's and I was like, let me wash the floors for $3 an hour. Like, and I'll oh, just come that? here. They wouldn't let me. They said, you don't have a green card, you can't. And I eventually duped the guy into getting me a job as a telemarketer for 12 bucks an hour. And oh, you're a telemarketer? Yeah. And, and the best part, well, actually, <laughs> my entire- Start as a telemarketer. My <laughs> entire career was launched off of being a telemarketer because okay. I was the only guy in the office uh -huh. whose $12 an hour I hanged on to, like my entire life yeah, depended yeah. on it. Because uh -huh. I didn't have, what I had either a dollar yeah. or $12, right? You, like $12 was really good. So. Uh, I would sell windows, siding, and roofing. On the telemarketing calls? Yeah, so okay. I would basically set appointments and they would go sell those. Mm -hmm. And and the thing for me was, it was a real job. Yeah. And even though I wasn't supposed to be there, they were paying me. Yeah. So I was like, I gotta take this seriously. And you know what happened? Everybody in the office kept quitting, like, oh, there's better jobs out there, whatever. High turnovers, And for me, Very stressful. it was, I kept getting better. I kept yeah. going to the sales team, I was like, how do you guys sell windows? Tell me so I can get right. better at setting appointments better. And I started taking my $200 paycheck, into mm. $2,500 a week in commissions. Nice. 
And by the age of like 17, I was basically running that entire office. I had mm. an 80K a year salary. Nice. I was now legal. I now had a green card, so it was okay to continue working there. Mm -hmm. And I was a 17 year old making 80K a year. And, and so now I had leverage from right? telemarketing. Yeah, and I had from yeah. telemarketing and managing that small office at the right. time because I had gotten promoted twice. Wow. But the point was that I took my job seriously. No matter how dumb it was, no matter how horrible people said it was, or mm -hmm. how I said, this is what I have and I'm going to be really right. good at it. You're getting the most from it instead of just yeah, trying to get exactly. it. Like, I said, it, if right? I'm going to come here, like I've yeah. had this philosophy when I was young, which was if you're going to spend an hour doing something, mm -hmm. Whatever you committed that hour to, make sure you do it really well. I don't care what it is. Like, it doesn't matter. You want to play video games, become the best video game player. You want to go clean floors, mm -hmm. don't do a half-ass job. Clean the floors really well. You know, like, okay. and this mentality was ingrained in me that if you commit to something, I don't care what it is, yeah. that is committing to help your friend, committing to do video work, committing to trade watches, right. just become really good at it. Do you feel that um, that transition of being well-to-do when you guys, you know, were younger until really poor? Mm -hmm. that transition uh, instilled in your mind or gave you a different perspective where it's like, holy shit, okay, I was rich and then now I'm poor. No, I gotta be I've never, rich. Like, I never knew the rich side. I was three years old when we left Iran. Mm. I never got a glimpse of that lifestyle. There are elements that always stuck with me when my mom would tell me stories of how the king would show up in a Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. So when I got rich, I was like, I'll buy you a Rolls Royce, so fuck the right. king. You know, like, <laughs> like you, know, you, you can go suck it. <laughs> <That's good. That's laughs> I have nicer cars than the king yeah. of Saudi Arabia. I don't give a shit. That's know? so funny. So, like, I, I don't care. Like, that didn't, mm -hmm. like, to me, it was more about, like, that element of it mm -hmm. to, to make sure my mom had, like, like I've always like, felt that my mom abandoned her. her personal life and her wealth to mm -hmm. give me an opportunity. And I always told myself that if I use that opportunity to go to school and mm -hmm. just become a lawyer or a doctor, they would be pathetic Like to just be the conventional guy that a woman who was making mm -hmm. more money than a doctor or a lawyer gave up her life so that her son could become, become the same as she was. Yeah. So I had to be some, I, I had this burden on my shoulder that was like, I have to do something spectacular. Mm -hmm. And it has to be different so that her legacy and mine not only lives on, but mm. it quadruples over what could have been for her. So I told myself, what was the highest peak that her job could have ever paid her mm. or gotten her? And I said, I have to do 10 times that, whatever that is. Nice. So I was like, a doctor lawyer wouldn't get me there. So I was like, that's not going to work. And so I started looking and I was young and I was 18. And I was like, what do I want my life to look like? And it wasn't about entrepreneurship, business. Mm -hmm. I didn't care about any of that stuff. What I cared about was money. I was like, I sure. still want more money. I'm not rich yet. 80,000 a year is nothing. Yeah. And even then it was great for a 17 year old. That's but a it lot wasn't for a 17. Like, for yeah. a 17 year old. But yeah. you see, I never compared myself to a 17 year old. I mm -hmm. compared myself to 80,000 a year is nothing. Right. I didn't think for me it's great. Because I, I never looked at life for me. I looked at life in general. So at that time you're a branch manager. So I left, Manage. I left telemarketing and I, this was a, that's a two hour story by itself of how I convinced <laughs> a guy to make me a bank manager at 18, which made mm -hmm. me the youngest bank manager in the US. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So, and a bank manager and then what was the next step? So then I became, uh, I became a banking like VP and I kind of okay. continued to move my way up until I was about 23. Okay. Then I led uh, a whole project called airport banking for that bank, which was mm -hmm. creating like airport, uh, banks, like banks inside airports. Okay. So I had that project and then at 25, I basically became a really arrogant prick who never went to work because I was just like so good at what I did. Mm. And I clashed with my new boss's boss and just mm. like things started going spiraling down. Corbin. And and that was another pivotal point, you asked me about that, which mm. was I used to drive a Lamborghini to work. Okay. And I was- At 25? Uh, actually at 23. Okay. So I was like a, that jackass that would show up in an orange Lamborghini, park mm -hmm. it sideways in two spots, mm -hmm. you know, like, and even like tell the handicapped guy, walk mm -hmm. from over there. <laughs> and I was that guy, right? But, mm -hmm. but one of the things that happened is one day I was sitting at a board meeting mm -hmm. and I look outside the window and all my peers, you know, all equally successful in their field, like in their departments in the bank, sure. all driving like Lexus LSs, you know, mm -hmm. S classes, et cetera, all black, silver, et cetera. I'm the yeah. only orange Lamborghini. <laughs> and I had already kind of detached my mind from working there anymore. I was like kind of annoyed. You know, I was like, right. this is too easy, this is too stupid. And like nobody, like I kept trying to get people to level up. I was like, aspire for more, man. Like mm -hmm. you can have a Lamborghini too. And I was like trying You're to like, get people. Eh. But, but they were just like, yeah, that's, that's, that doesn't make any sense, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and they kept thinking like my side businesses were making me millions. And 
I was doing really good in real estate on the side, which was mm -hmm. a fair point, but it wasn't how I was getting the car. So I was like, mm -hmm. hey, you guys can do it too. But nobody kept, nobody wanted to talk to me. Everybody kept looking at me like a black sheep. Mm -hmm. And I started realizing that I was wrong. They, they were right. Because, because I, I worked in a bank. Mm -hmm. I worked in a place where people devoted 20 years of their life to a job, okay. to a job working for others. Right. And I kept saying, let's innovate, let's go up, let's yeah. go big. They've been molded, you feel like? Well, no, I was the outlier, meaning I right. was the one that didn't belong there. They belonged exactly there. There They've were 20 of their the... sedans. There was uh -huh. one Lamborghini, right? right? So the black sheep wasn't them not getting it. It was me not willing to but comply. You shouldn't be. <laughs> you so shouldn't I was be like, my Lamborghini that. doesn't belong there. Yeah. So I was like, I think it would make sense if I just left you know so mm. like i started contemplating in my head like what that would look like and then that fear kicks in you know like do you give up a quarter million dollar job a million dollar bonus to go mm. work Whatever you know else. figure out like how to build no a security. business right so all of these things are there i'm already a millionaire by then so i'm like i don't yeah. need like uh, like how do you replace that pool you know and that comfort mm. and that convenience with a, a startup you know right. and, and go there so i started thinking that way and i started kind of like that fear frightening me but my disagreements with my boss basically led me to kind of being, I fired myself by just throwing my badge and be like, oh, they'll call mm -hmm. me tomorrow. You know, think they never called me. They were like this off. So I was like, okay, well, I guess that sucks, but that's not how I wanted it to, yeah, you yeah. know, and I, that kind of kicked in. Mm -hmm. But then I started realizing I took a year, built a business that didn't do anything at all, completely went to shit. Like meaning I thought I would sell other banks, like a lot of the trade secrets that had made me really successful being a banker, sure. you know, like for their employees and stuff mm -hmm. that didn't work out at all like that was a complete failure was that the first uh venture that you went out on yeah that was my first like okay. you know i'm so good in leadership because i was like the yeah. number one leader across the entire board all the time and i was like i'm so good everyone else should want to know that you know like what i did like with the banks did you have other uh supporting assets businesses on the side where only real estate i mm -hmm. was really good in buying lots and nice. basically i figured out how to buy lots in northern virginia ahead of schedule mm -hmm. before they were built and basically resell them to developers and uh, people higher. that wanted yeah so <laughs> it was like okay i wasn't You're even like... putting up the money because it was this was a really funny thing i used mm -hmm. to go back and you at the time we had mortgage pre-approval letters mm -hmm. at the bank and i basically nobody even questioned this was like pre-08 nobody even questioned yeah. why i was signing my own mortgage pre-approvals and i was <laughs> like yeah it doesn't matter you had you were signing yeah. it all <laughs> Because I was the banker, Approved. the lender. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And they wouldn't even care. Like all they wanted, just they were yeah, greedy. Mean, so they, yeah. everybody was in that green mode where yeah. they were like, good Everybody's enough. Make you know, money, like yeah. good enough. Doesn't matter. I was like, okay, whatever. So I did that seventy-two times and basically sold seventy-two lots. Okay. So I made a couple of mil doing that, and that gave me a lot of that extra security where I didn't have mm -hmm. to give a shit about my job. I was like, mm -hmm. I'm coming to work. Like you guys should be kissing my ass for being here. Yeah. And then I eventually left that. And a year after what happened is this, like, oh, it was about 06 or seven when mm. I, I was a banker before. So I knew the markets were shifting, right? I started paying attention and I said, everything's about to crash. Mm -hmm. And I always knew because I was self-studied myself that the environment would cause mm -hmm. uh, opportunity. Because I said, yeah. I always used to say the biggest wealth is always created in the crashes, never in the booms, you know? So I looked at that and I said, okay, so how do I take advantage of this? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know, I was like, well, I can clue this. I'm like sitting there, like Watching do I the buy market. real estate? Yeah. You know, like, what do I buy? Trying to figure it out. Yeah, and I had started a small tuning shop. So I used to tune cars and stuff okay. there, you know, on the side that was yeah, my yeah, like, yeah. car wash tuning and everything. And that was a hobby slash uh, something to do. Okay. And one of the things was we had a big supplier that was a Ferrari dealership. And this supplier used to buy wheels and stuff from us, put them mm -hmm. on cars and sell them. So Bought from you guys? Yeah, so they would they okay. tell us to come customize their cars so they could sell cars customized to okay. people. And it would work for them because we would put the money up, up front when they sold the car, they would pay us. So they didn't have to prepay mm -hmm. for the parts, you know, and it made mm -hmm. the cars more attractive. It had really good taste and design. It helped. But one of the key things that occurred then is that I realized our contracts were about to end because I walked in one time and they mm -hmm. were like, hey, we're not going to do any more cars. And I started paying attention. I was like, they're starting to anticipate and feel this this kind of credit pullback and everything right, that's happening. Right. And I was like, it's going it's gonna to get bad. So I was mm -hmm. like, it, like, I was right. It's going to get it was bad. It like 07? Uh, it was like late 07, right? Okay. And then in 08, uh, I started buying up basically mm -hmm. all, like I went in one time and they were like, yeah, we're just going to have to close because we're not doing any business. The overhead's too high. So I was like, what mm -hmm. if I buy all your Ferraris? And they were like, what do you mean? I was like, all of them. <laughs> and they were like, you, <laughs> the guy that owns dealership. your little tuning shop, yeah, 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 yeah. you're going to buy all my Ferraris. I'm like, yeah. all of them. Uh -huh. So they were like, what do you want? I was like, yeah. I want a discount. It's a heavy yeah, discount, yeah. but I'll buy all of them. 
Mm -hmm. So I was like, I didn't even know how many Ferraris I had in the building, you know, because right. like, they had Ferraris elsewhere too. So I was like, I'll buy all of them. <laughs> so the guy comes back and he's like, my GM said, if you want to buy all of them, it would mm -hmm. be 20 off. And okay. I was like, 20 oh, off their price? Yeah, 20% off MSRP. Okay. Now I said, I want 40 off. Mm -hmm. The guy's like, yeah, that doesn't work that way. I was like, okay, well, fuck it. Bad idea then. I moved on. Yeah. He called me back he, uh, like a couple of weeks later and mm -hmm. was like, can, if we can go somewhere around 30, we can get something done. Yeah. So I go, well, give me a list of all the cars. Right. Well, so he gives me this list, like $4 million. And I'm mm -hmm. like, fuck, I got $4 million uh -huh. to buy all these cars. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. have $4 million to waste in that. I had like two and change, basically. And so what I did is I had a lot of contacts in banking before that trusted me. Mm -hmm. There were investors and people that were investing in that bank. So sure. I was like, I called people and I was like, do you want to come in? I probably made like 200 calls. Mm -hmm. And I got like two dudes that were like, yeah, like we'd do something with you. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I'll manage everything. You right. guys just put up some money, you know, and together mm -hmm. we're going. And I was telling them, I was like, I'm going in too. Right. So they thought I was a lot richer than I was. They mm -hmm. thought I was like 10 million deep, you know, like in money. And the, I wasn't. The, the guys, the investors, okay, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they were like, oh, you always have these cars. And yeah. they didn't understand how cars work. So they were like, you must have like a lot of money. And mm -hmm. I was, they were like, well, how much are you going in? Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, we're each going in 2 million. Mm -hmm. You know, so nice. like you go in two million too, and I was like, mm -hmm. "Fuck, I only have like two and a half million." Like, <laughs> okay. that's like all my money. So yeah. I was like, "Fine." I was like, "I'll do it." So I basically mm -hmm. went broke buying Ferraris. You know, together we basically bought out this money, and uh, there was some money left. You know, yeah. which gave us the gave me the ability to buy more cars. So I mm -hmm. went to other dealerships, started doing the same, and then I realized that I had all these cars sitting here. Right. Nobody was buying cars, so I wasn't mm -hmm. going to be any luckier selling them. And now I'm like sitting on all these cars. So I is, have no cash. So is that like uh, how this entire car thing got started? Yeah. So I had all these cars. Right? I had no cash flow. Uh -huh. And I had to be like, how do I come up with cash? How do off. I break? Well, but okay. it still wasn't wasn't pulling up big numbers, you know, and right. I didn't want to be a dealer. So I used my investment background to basically understand that, look, mm -hmm. this is going to recover. And I don't think these cars are going anywhere. At mm -hmm. the dollar, I got them. So that's where my whole strategy of parking money mm -hmm. came, came from. So I started looking at that and I said, how do I get more cash flow? Mm -hmm. You know, like that was the key, like, cause there was a car sitting here, no right. cash flow. That's just wealth preservation. Asset, it's not, yeah, yeah just, it's not like it's not actually good. making anything. Even if the asset goes up, it has to be sold to make a return, Correct. right? And all my money's tied in this. So after I kind of figured this out, I was like, this isn't gonna work. So I started looking at how can I buy more cars? How can I sell some cars, mm -hmm. but only keep certain cars, sell others, but buy as bulk so I get bigger discounts. Mm -hmm. And I gave birth to this whole business I had there called VIP Motoring at the time, which was okay. basically buying and trading really rare cars. Mm -hmm. And then that evolved to getting investors to come in and fuel some of these cars and then getting allocation for rare cars. Mm -hmm. And I still had a huge cash flow issue because every time I had to basically become a dealer and I didn't want to be a dealer. Mm -hmm. But then I realized I had a pool of people that actually wanted to buy cars themselves and drive them. And this mm -hmm. wasn't a question of driving them, this was a question of parking them. So I started coming up with models where if you invest with me, you can drive one of the cars. You know, like mm. I'll basically give you one this of the cars. This is the VIP motors. Yeah, so I was like, okay. you can drive one of the cars and the rest yeah, is okay. an investment. You know, so right. I, I would then like buy cars. Yeah, yeah, so I would club. buy cars. At first it was a club, you could say that. But yeah. after that, it became a, a more thorough business because I okay. figured out the angles that people wanted cars, watches, and art. Right. And so I started figuring out the models uh, in the cars, which cars had money, which cars could be driven, which cars needed no miles on them to be worth the most. And mm. I kept going and going and going until I figured out this algorithm of what worked and what didn't work. You know, mm. and so I built this entire business model off of that and uh, off of watches, cars, and art, and realized uh, what the reason we even got in watches is because one thing I thought to myself was like, what are the other things people with a lot of money mm -hmm. buy? You know, and I would wear nice watches, not right. super nice like today, but nice watches. And I used to tell myself, I was like, well, you know what they buy? They buy watches, yachts, mm -hmm. and everything. So I did the same model for all those things. And I was like, there's no money in yachts, like unless you buy them, then there's a, you have to store them somewhere. I was in Virginia, I was like, I don't have water around me. You know, it's not helping. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I don't want to get in boats. I don't want to get in planes. So it was like, mm -hmm. the only option is to get in art, watches, and cars. So I started investigating watches and I mm -hmm. had realized one key thing in my life. That was another pivotal point in my life. I've never met a poor jeweler. Huh. I was like, I've never met a jeweler like that legitimately at a jewelry store, not like okay. I sell gold in your mall, but like a okay. real jewelry store yeah. where they had really nice watches. I never met a poor one. Everyone I knew was in mm -hmm. my car club with like the latest and greatest. And I was like, what do you know that I don't know? Sure. So I started making friends with a couple of jewelers, mm -hmm. started paying attention to their game, started kind of buying from them to learn, you know, right. ask questions. So I had that ability to talk. 
Mm -hmm. Lost a couple of bucks on a couple of watches, didn't matter, but I had created that contact where I could ask. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of all that, then realized how the watch game worked. Nice. And I got in it, you know, and I started basically now doing it for clients instead of just for yeah. myself. You know, like I got all the ins, the outs, the dollars, That's the cool. where to buy, et cetera. All, that? Put all of that together and it continued to give birth to VIP motoring, which back in 2000, I think 2014, its peak was like 400 mm. million in revenue. Mm. That was my biggest revenue business, but it was also my shittiest business because it would give me $2 million net. How far? Yeah, I was like, this is fucking retarded. This is like half of yeah. like, yeah, I'm so poor. Like, yeah. this is stupid. So I started realizing that like there wasn't going to be a longevity and a lot of work. Mm. And, and one of the things I've learned young in banking was like money liability matters. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was like 400 million in transaction for 2 million in net. That's crazy. Yeah. Horrible. I was like, this is a horrible model. It's like so fragile. Still two mil two mil but nice. it's still <laughs> fragile. You know, like yeah, you have yeah. so much room. You have 300, yeah. you have 418 million dollars yeah. in obstacles to make your two. And I yeah. was like, this is horrible. So I, I just never like thought of that as a good business model. So years ago, I decided I was like, we need to come up with a model where mm -hmm. I can not only continue to do what I do, but really focus on, on closing the gap. Did that? Was that did that lead to you know the watch trading academy? Like, did that give yeah. birth to this? Well, the watch trading academy, exotic car hacks are a byproduct of what VIP motoring was all the years, except yeah. it was a do it yourself at home solution, right? It was basically like the club was for five million dollar people and up, mm -hmm. but we didn't have a lot of those people, so it wasn't like hundreds of those people were coming in. I had mm -hmm. 40 clients, that was it. Now, the other side of it was, well, I want a Ferrari and I want a watch, but I don't have five million dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, you, sir, I can teach for $5,000. You know how to do this. And then I was like, well, why am I doing this? This isn't residually okay. Right. So it was like, why don't you just put it online? And I had just started Seek Yeah. And Seek was picking up steam and I was learning the online algorithm of how things worked online. How do you teach online? Mm. What do you sell? What do you not do? And while Seek was always a passion project, it was more about teaching and never about mm -hmm. really revenue making, it, it became successful and it's only like $3 million, but it wasn't really... A, a huge money maker for me. It wasn't like I didn't go into it like I want to make money online. And specifically, uh, for you guys that don't know Secret Entourage, you have you interview people, um, and they kind of present to you and the audience like how their business model works and mm -hmm. kind of ins and outs of business. So, so originally, when we started it, it was about doing the lifestyles of the people that have the cars. Mm. But but talking about the person, I was like, how are you okay. rich? Like, what do you do? Yeah. And then really vetting that person to make sure they didn't inherit money or something, and it right. was really something they're doing, and then bring that. This was back in 2008. Nobody was yeah. doing podcasts. Nobody was doing right, this right. stuff. Like, this was very early, right? Yeah. So I was doing that, and I used mediums like social media to basically bring this content to people. Because at yeah. the time, I said, we don't need to advertise. We basically need to be where people are, like kids are. Mm -hmm. And we need to give them opportunities to see into the lives of things they don't see. So. That's, that was the birth of Secret Entourage. Then we monetized it because it became bigger and bigger mm. and bigger and we started, we, we became a business out of right. it. But it was never intended to be a business. But, but the core concepts in it, the mm -hmm. way the business worked, was very much relevant to selling information online. At which point I said, since that's my passion project, let that's me cool. launch Exotic Car Hacks and Watch yeah. Trading Academy. So you took that and then boom. So, yeah, exactly. And I, and I replicated the platforms yeah. and basically created a model that was for watches, wealth creation, and for cars, wealth preservation. Mm -hmm. And I built these two models. And what was funny is Exotic Car Hacks launched first. And in its two years, did basically what Secret did in 10 years in mm. revenue. And then Watch Trading Academy did what Exotic Car Hacks and Secret did in their 12 years together in six That's months. That's insane. Yeah. So, like, That's the shocking, concept actually. was, yeah. Wow. So, today we sit on the core of, you know, a near $20 million business. Mm -hmm. In, in the space of selling information, right. which is good. And the only way we've been able to consistently do it over the last five years and mm -hmm. grow year after year is because one, the information we sell is good. Two, the value we create is real. It's not about selling an infomercial. It's right. about teaching what I'm currently practicing. And I think that's one of the big things. People teach real estate after they're done real estate and they mm -hmm. go, oh, this is a great channel you mm -hmm. know, for like making money. So now I'm gonna be a teacher. You know, It's mm -hmm. easier and I'm, I wanna stay home. For me, it's more like, look, it's journaling. So it's basically like, this is what I do. And right. people kind of follow along and join our communities. And our communities are incredibly active. Mm -hmm. I'm in them. I'm not the guy that acts like, you got to pay me 10 grand to talk to you. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, I'm in the community every day answering yeah. the normal guy that just bought a $200 membership. Just the same way yeah. I'm answering the other guy that has a $10,000 membership. Right. You know, so that value and that real 
teacher mentality for me has helped basically not make it about entrepreneurship, but rather make it Very about good. teaching, you know, yeah. and use that medium to reach people. Nice. And then here, you have some watches. You brought some I watches. A, yeah, right? these are some of my personal collection watches. Okay, so cool. So everything from a Richard Mille here. Uh, this is the- oh, I've never seen that. Yeah, what? this is one of the rarest Richard Mills. It's called the RM63. Uh, this is actually the one in that painting back there. Uh, this was inspired by a, a French poet uh, that basically this watch stops time. So there's a there's a whole mechanism story to it, but if you look at the domed glass, it's really mm -hmm. cool too. Like it's really like curved. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's got a lot thing, of cool right? elements. And what happens is the the watch basically keeps time, and if you press yeah. this button, mm -hmm. the dial basically changes. The and, dial changes. Yeah, and what happens is it stops time. Mm. So then it's still the the mechanism continues, mm -hmm. but the dial just randomly shifts itself. It's called a dizzy hand. So it randomly shifts. The one will be here, the twelve will yeah, be here, yeah. etc. Every fifteen minutes. Oh, but cool. it keeps time uh, for like five days, mm -hmm. even though it seems like it's all over the place. When you press the button back, it comes back to the time it should have been at. Oh, nice. And one of the best things about it is that there's a carving in the inside of the that basically says the same thing as a painting, which mm -hmm. is only wise people know how to use time. Mm -hmm. For the unwise basically lose it, and the wise basically That's know true. how to manipulate it. That is Yeah, true. so I thought that was a very meaningful yeah. piece, and I love it. Well, it's, these, that uh, Richard Mills too, initially they were trading, or they were very being cheap. sold. Yeah, very it was cheap. like under MSRP, yeah, 40 right? 40% off. And then yeah. so, like, this what? was 120K, at some point you could buy this for like 45K. Yeah, and then Today what, this what? watch is 130K. So what happened? And then, do you think it was like the athletes so, or No, was... watches are like that. Like the boutique watches start until they pick up, just like stocks. Like mm -hmm. penny stocks go on until sure. the company does something and at some point it becomes a real stock. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's no longer a penny yeah. stock that people are trading, yeah. it becomes real. And that's what happens with boutique watches. This is a very similar thing for Hublot. You could buy Hublot's very cheap before. Mm -hmm. This is a yeah. very rare uh, Orlinsky. Orlinsky is the mm -hmm. world famous artist that creates basically the gorillas and the panthers in square shapes. And he made the case for this Hublot. And mm -hmm. it's like just a really rare version. I don't usually like Hublot too much. It's not like a very prestigious brand, but because of the artist collaboration on this one, like this case is just so unique. And you, see, you don't feel like Hublot is a Hublot is on investment grade pieces. This one yeah. is just more of a rare piece. So it's just something that you won't see on people's wrists. I feel like Hublot's, they fit so well. Like, I don't Hub know. You, the one thing with right. Hublot is the movements aren't exciting, but the, the designs are. Like, they're very design friendly, you yeah. know, and they build, they're very innovative. This is an AP, very uh, simple Buescher. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the MBNF machine. This is a very cool watch. A lot of people don't know if these even exist. There's 18 of those made, and this is white gold. Uh, this is one of the rarest Rolexes in Insane. existence. Ooh. Yeah, this is the skeleton Daytona commissioned by Artisan de Genève. It's the only uh, company that is approved by Rolex to commission mm -hmm. the skeleton. So this nice. is 150 grand new, and now it trends at 200. The, the rarity of that is not in the money yet, it's just in the fact that it's impossible to get anywhere. And it's now discontinued in full, so you just won't see them anymore. Mm. And it's very unique, you know? So if you like Rolex, this is like Definitely. basically, it's almost the grail until you see the <laughs> watch that there you go. new right. was 100 and now trading used for 400. Insane. So that's the uh, Rainbow 2020, uh, 100,000 new, 400 to 450 Insane. Years. Insane. I'm not a big diamond wearing guy, so it, you mm. know I can't really like rock this too hard because I feel weird doing really it. Really, you live in Florida. I mean, yeah, I know. I could. Just <laughs> I mean, this is nothing more than a sky dweller, but with the discontinued yeah, dial yeah. in rose gold, and this is the rarest. Blue face. Well, Blue. this is the rarest Audemars brick because it's mm -hmm. uh, the only one that was done in yellow gold with a blue face. Mm. So this, this is, is this is the only one. Meaning, this is the only model, model that was done, and it's discontinued. It discontinued last year. Yeah. So this oh, is the same brick you've seen, you know, like it's basically the, all of the bricks are made out of one brick of gold. You know, that's why they're called bricks. Nice. But super nice watch, you know, but the yellow gold and the blue dial really gives it its difference from the typical brick you see. Yeah, no, it looks great. Yeah, so these are some of the watches from my personal collection that I enjoy the most. So not, none of these are personally for sale, but they're a great like, opportunity to park money. The thing is, I tell people, you don't have to choose between real estate. Mm. You can and do watches. Yeah. The, the benefit of cars, watches, real estate, art <laughs> you is that free. money is almost infinite in the world. Meaning, yeah. like once you get good at understanding money, there's never a problem finding it. 
Mm. Like if you're a talented real estate investor, people will always give you money. If you're a talented right. washer, people will always like, how can I invest with you? How can I give mm. you millions of dollars so you can do this for sure. me? So, so money is never the issue. The issue is asset purchase is the hardest mm. thing to do. Mm. It's so hard to buy assets. Like you run mm. out of houses to buy. If you had yeah. all the houses you could buy, if you knew every house would make you oh, 100K, man. you would be like, I'll find money. I'll go to yeah. all the people I know, be like, everybody give me 10 million, we'll turn it into that. The problem is you don't have enough houses to buy. And so right. you need to start diversifying into other asset, asset classes, classes. That, yeah. that you're like, what else can I buy? Yeah. So you can buy this while doing a house. So you're mm -hmm. renovating the house a year later, you sell it. You're like, there I made 200 go. grand. The same time throwing the watch, you know, and be like, I just doubled up my money. Yeah, that is true. Because for our business right now, the bottleneck is inventory. Right. Just right. like every business. Finding... So even watches and cars <laughs> are the same thing. You yeah. don't have enough inventory and there's always more money. That is what creates a competitive marketplace. Mm. Lack lack of supply, mm -hmm. heavier demand, it, it prices go up, right? You compete against other wholesalers, other yeah. realtors to buy right. homes, right? Right. If you don't, then the price doesn't go up. If you're mm -hmm. the only guy showing up and going, I'll yeah, buy that house, they're like, let's discount it, let's sell mm -hmm. you the house. But the only reason you go in fast with mm -hmm. the highest offer is because you have 10 other people behind you, yeah, you that are like, I'll snatch I'll, it up. If, as soon as they see you didn't buy it, mm -hmm. Or that you're not in the game, like boom, I'll buy it. You know, like, and, and then you go, and if they realize that, then price keeps fighting. You know, everybody's right. like, I'll buy it, I'll buy it, I'll buy it. And then other people see it, and then they think right. the asset is worth and, more. And markets move up. Yeah. You know, and so the same thing happens with watches. And there's a, mm. there's very few of the right watches on the market. And I think that's very why they're few. Very right. few. Okay. There's like you can't get to one. be profitable. Like, like right. You're like they, okay, like yeah. you can't walk in a boutique and buy this. Yeah. It's not discontinued, but each boutique will get one a year. Mm -hmm. But there's hundreds of us that want this mm. and hundreds of us that have relationships with that boutique. Right. So they get one, mm. like one, not like a hundred, one. Yeah. So like there's a hundred per boutique that want it. There's one guy. Mm. So price goes, well, 200. You know, man, if you want it, that's the price. He provides many opportunities for someone to kind of like enter like cars, watches, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And then just like pick your interest and be able to dive in. And kind of learn that industry through someone who has done it already and trust me you know if you're watching and you're thinking well i could do the same thing yeah you can it will take you really long time though right yeah, it you're took me 15 years to learn this like you're gonna go through 15 years or you can are you going to go through a course and then you know utilize the course to kind of bounce off that leverage off that too we have 18 year old students today yeah. who are making 300k a year trading watches okay while they're going to college they started when they were 16. <laughs> Yeah, like their I parents believe didn't believe. I had to invite one of these students' parents to my house mm -hmm. so they know I'm not conning their kid. Yeah. Into like, oh, and, I, and awesome. I was like, that is awesome. I, I didn't yeah, mind. Yeah. I was like, come over. Yeah. And the dad and, was all sold after. He was like, this okay. is awesome. Like, yeah. you know, like, I'm glad he got this. But two years later now, the kid's going to college, he's making 300K. Yeah. It's a lot With of the money. Like, parents, like, like awesome. I mean, think like the CEO of like companies don't make 300K a year. Yeah. You know, like, and, and this kid is like, I have all my freedom while I'm going to college, making 300K. And he's not. An outlier. He's one of many doing similar things between 100 mm. to 300 after two, three years. And to me, when I look at that, I go, in my old age, I wish I would have had a hobby that was making me 200K right. a year while I was going to school. Well, you now provide the opportunity for them to have that hobby. Right. But I've always, you know, one of my choices in, in my conscious life was always to go from being a money guy to a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I knew one day when I showed up in my McLaren at Starbucks, and someone was like, mm. what do you do for a living? And I just looked at him and I was like, I'm a teacher. <laughs> and, she, and she laughed and she's like, I'm a teacher too. Like and, different teachers. No, and we looked at each other and I was like, trust me, we teach very different things. <laughs> different and then I just got in my car and left. And she's yeah. like, can I take a photo? I'm like, sure. I, I thought to myself, give her, did you like, give her a card? Don't be, huh? Did you give her a card? No, I don't least? do a card. I've never had a business card since I was oh, okay. like 25 years Your old. Your Instagram or something? Like, no. you gotta, you gotta, like, no, I, you give her that, a rope, that's right? The thing Just for give me. her like, a ladder. Like, I've always believed that, that's so and funny. this is why I don't know if you, if you see me in my communities, I'm very direct with people. I'm mm. a very, I'm considered a huge asshole. Even on Netflix when I was on my show, people oh, were like, this guy's debatable. a big. But you know, but this is the thing with me. Yeah. I'm not a teacher for everyone. When yeah, a student yeah. is ready to find me, mm. they will find me for what I teach, mm. not for the fact that I want them to find me so I can make money off of them. Mm. That's why I love what I do and I've done it long enough where I don't need someone to come in and say, well, you know, you, you charge me money, so I'm owed this. Mm -hmm. Usually when people say that in my community, I'm like, you can walk yourself out, Whoa. here's your money and have a good day. Yeah. Like, and, and, and I, they go, oh, so I'm gonna get a refund. I'm like, yeah, you already did. Have a good day. <laughs> like, Goodbye. And, 
we don't care. Like the, the point is I've never taught because I wanted to make money. I thought because I believe in what I teach. Mm -hmm. And if people don't want to believe in it, then they shouldn't work on it. Yeah. You know, like this isn't like, that's, for, that's yeah. how I basically, you know, do all my teaching. And I think Carrier, that's why community having done it for five plus years now across these two platforms, it's been super successful because nice. of that mentality. Tell us about this, man. This is your, how many books have you written? Three. 12, 12 total. Three oh, bestsellers. Yeah. You wrote 12 books. I, I wrote nine of them that sucked. Okay. I so never read a book in my you? life, so I wrote nine books just because I wanted to journal stuff. Were you an English major? Or did no, you? I never went to school. Okay. I dropped out of school uh, like about two, three months after I started college. So how, how did books, like tell me about the, like how did all this? <laughs> well, I just, at Secret Rounds, I used to write blogs, right? Like uh -huh. for, for business and everything else. So I decided yeah. to write books on business, on finance, things I knew, leadership, things I knew in banking, and mm -hmm. they didn't really become popular. So it weren't like really hot and I didn't know how to sell a book, you know, like mm. so two, there's two concepts there mm -hmm. or market a book. So I didn't. And one thing that happened to me was in 2011 when I actually moved to Florida, mm -hmm. I decided I was like, the reason my books don't work is they're basically concepts I've learned from other people. Like I've okay. learned money from other people. It wasn't like magical. Mm -hmm. So I said, what can I teach people that I'm the only one that knows? What makes me unique? What mm. is it that I know? And I said, I'm naturally just significantly more aware and self-aware than most people. So it was mm -hmm. like, why am I the way I am? So I basically yeah. journaled my entire growth from a state of awareness to self-awareness. And mm -hmm. I gave birth to my first bestseller called Third Circle Theory, right. which was my concept about human evolution and how we all fit into three circles. Right. Uh, and so that became a very popular book, sold over 2 million copies now, which was fantastic. Introduced me to that. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> because you should check this out. I'm like, yeah. what, is, what so, is this? So that, that yeah. book was a big part of it, and it wasn't complete. I kept uh -huh. saying like, oh, it's a great book. I, mm -hmm. I like my own book. I was like, oh, finally a book that I believe in. I believe yeah, in this yeah. concept. It's my book. And I, I love the book, and I believe it would get really big because I believe the concept was valuable, mm -hmm. but it wasn't complete. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote a sequel called Radius which stood for reaching across different industries on covering solution. And it mm -hmm. was perceived as a business book. Mm -hmm. So it was an entrepreneur book. Mm -hmm. And people were like, oh, he's teaching business now. And I was like, not mm -hmm. really. Radius was my own, again, my own version mm -hmm. of what I believed entrepreneurship to be, which to me sure. is unity around creation. Okay. So it was creators that help unite people either around them mm -hmm. as customers, as coworkers, as you know, team members, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So it was creating something and allowing others to unite around it. And to me, that was what that book was about. But mm -hmm. then came my own journey from basically awareness to self-awareness to entering my own realm of consciousness. And one okay. thing that happened when I did that was I started realizing that what my second book was, and it wasn't mm -hmm. what I thought it was originally. Okay. I so wrote was? it that way. It was the bridge to consciousness. Okay. Because I believe that the biggest the easiest way to go from self-awareness to entering the realm of consciousness mm -hmm. is true creation. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the core reasons why a lot of moms and dads believe their kids are basically mm. like their purpose. You know, they change because they create something because they've never created something else. Interesting. So they usually yeah. go like, oh, I don't have something. This is my creation to the world. Mm -hmm. So they, they realm around it and they believe that entering their realm of consciousness comes through their children. So yeah. For me, I was like, I analyzed all that and I was like, okay, so I'm gonna go through my own journey of consciousness, which was really hard three years. Mm -hmm. And I was like, when I'm done, I'm basically, as I go through it, I'm gonna journal my, my entire evolution and what right. I've learned, what I've opened the gate to. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called the gate of choice. And one of the biggest misconceptions I had in my own life was that as human beings, we are the byproduct of our choices. So we make choices and we, whatever consequences come from that, we're that. And I was wrong. So okay. I, I only knew that because I wasn't conscious when I knew that. Mm. And there was the, the big understanding to going to consciousness is your ability to perceive time differently, understand that value systems uh, no longer exist in the right and wrong and the good and bad. Mm. And more yes. importantly, more than anything else, to understand that choice is the navigation tool that is only secondary to intent. Hmm. And intent is the ultimate driver of human consciousness. Meaning what is your intent with your experience of time? Hmm. And, and so if you understand that, you intent break- Intent like of your experience of time. Of time, okay, yeah. all right. So well. if you break free 
and are able to control this very easy statement, which is very difficult to do, right. no. to 100% of all time, mm -hmm. manage and create an experience based on an intent, then you're able to be free of what no other human can be free of, which is okay. prisoners of time. We mm -hmm. grow, we die. That's how a human's existence in their mind exists. So Which if, you, if yeah. you're able to break free of that mentality of life and death, which is yeah. a value system in itself, good and bad, another value system, right and wrong, another value system, and yeah. are able- They're all perception. Right, exactly. Yeah. But, but at, at some point, you, one of the mistakes I used to make is a belief that there was a universal right and there mm. was a universal wrong. And, and that yeah. was the mistake that I made for, for years, mm. you know, going through my own journey. This was part of the growth. Like, and I realized then it wasn't a mistake. It was just part of the evolution. You have to engage in a right and wrong system mm -hmm. uh, in order to understand what a good and bad system is to then you know, get into uh, a wisdom and deceit system. But the, the, the core concept is that time is the ultimate prison for man in the space. And mm -hmm. if you understand how dimensional awareness works, then you understand that we exist in the fourth dimension, mm -hmm. but we can only live and function in the third. And if you can understand that concept, then the key to humanity is something that everyone has their own definition of what is the purpose of being human? You know, mm. was it God? Was it this? And my own evolution to consciousness has made me accept two very fundamental concepts. The first one is that man's only, only mm. path to happiness is progress. And that Agreed. if... If progress doesn't occur, Agreed. man cannot exist. Meaning like that mm -hmm. depression occurs, you know, because you're Agreed. basically falling behind time. Absolutely so, agree. So that's, agree that, that is one, one of the things that, that really came clear, you mm -hmm. know? And, and the second thing that really uh, just comes clear is that we're only prisoners of time because we exist in our bodies, mm -hmm. not in our souls. So, so the, the path, bodies, right? So, so they're separating. Yeah. And sure. consciousness is about connecting the two. Mm. And when the two connect, then your body no longer suffers from the effects of mm. time. Okay. And so that's something much. I mean, this in itself is a ten-hour conversation, but a lot of that is documented in here. A lot of things people have never looked at, like tarot cards, astrology, things that mm -hmm. are maybe looked at as unique, simple things on their own. They're like, oh, you know, you have a sign. Like I'll, get, I'll tell you something very cool from the book that maybe will interest people. How many hours are on a watch? How many hours? Yeah, how many hours do you see on your watch? Uh, there's a numerical number. Yeah, but, I'm saying uh, how many numbers? Yeah, uh, 12. 12. Okay, yeah. 12. How many zodiac signs? 12? Uh-huh. I'm guessing, I have no yes, idea. that's correct. 12? Okay. So the only difference between a clock and a zodiac sign is mm -hmm. that we have accepted that the clock starts at 12 mm -hmm. and, and it resets. We've mm -hmm. accepted that Aries is the first sign in astrology, mm. but it's not true. It's just a wheel. There's no beginning or ending to it. Sure. So astrology is to the fourth dimension mm -hmm. what a clock is to the third. So a human yeah. body acts on, on an axis, basically Interesting. time, except the difference is a human body can only experience time mm. forward. But our fourth dimensional self experiences time all at once. So mm. it doesn't exist one second forward it exists across the spectrum of everything together so this is one of the key concepts that for example people never look at they never look mm -hmm. at the connection between astrology and being human yeah, I did. they look at it as that separate was, that was the first right they, now they look at it as <laughs> separate entities and so yeah. in this book basically i break down mm. how consciousness occurs what are some of these tools that have always been available for humans and they've never really paid attention to them and they're there. And if you learn to use them, then you actually realize mm -hmm. that the human body was engineered for the soul, just like the car was engineered for the body. The, the soul was basically needed a vessel and the vessel was engineered. If a child is born and he's born without an arm, mm -hmm. he's defective. Uh, we, relatively right, speaking. Meaning like the, he's yeah. not what we consider a normal child. Like mm -hmm. a normal person has two arms, two legs. Right. That's normal. If right. your car is missing a tire, Mm -hmm. on one the wheel falls off you don't go that's mm -hmm. normal that's normal that's how it's supposed to be you go that's right. abnormal you need, a, you need another way right so you can choose to accept that child as normal because he has three three limbs instead of four 
but it still doesn't change a factual evidence mm -hmm. that that is not how it was intended to be. Okay. Like the vessel, like a car was intended to have four tires and four wheels as of mm -hmm. now until we discover a better mode of transportation. Sure. That is what the effect of the body is. Like mm. we all have two lungs, you know, to this, to this, and Cares. we are built in a way mm -hmm. just to survive the ecosystem we're put on, which is Earth. Right. So, so the body is basically a, an, a walking car that's okay. much more advanced, like a biological <laughs> car. And as humans, everything we create Mm -hmm. is is a mirror image of what we understand of ourselves. Hmm. Cars have ECUs, they have motors, they have transmissions, right, you know, right. they have exoskeletons, like they have frames, right? Mm -hmm. We build everything as humans to mimic ourselves. So, so the same thing, if you can reverse engineer that up instead of down, mm -hmm. if you can start looking at what are we built off of, why do we exist as bodies? Right. What is our purpose here? Like, so all of these things become the questions that only through your own journey of consciousness mm -hmm you can make sense of, but this book will not tell you what to do. What this book will do is it will simply help you realize what has already been there to get you to start paying attention to it. So you can connect the dots better for yourself. And at different stages, things will make different sense. Nice. No, that is very interesting, man. So that's why, again, a lot of people don't understand me because they go, how does he go from cars yeah, no, I think, <laughs> to talking I about I think you've transcended. <laughs> Well, you're constantly evaluating yourself and you've built this, you know, you I, I'll, these I'll leave you with, with this thing that I think a lot of people understand. Most philosophers, I consider myself very much a philosopher into this mm. day and age. And one of the most philosophers I've ever examined, I've never examined their work per se. Okay. I've examined how they lived and I've examined how they thought of things. Mm. And one of the biggest disconnects philosophers always had with their concepts Okay. where that they rejected society because society was sick, broken, and, and they were very good at examining why. Hmm. The problem is because they always looked at society from an outside lens and were never able to connect the two. Hmm. You see, my journey to consciousness, like Van Gogh, perfect yeah, example. Sure. He was not rich during his time on earth. He could not Sad. sell a painting, yeah. but he couldn't because he was an artist. He was in a state of creation. He didn't understand society. Mm -hmm. And the, my path was different. I understood this going into my own journey of consciousness. And I, and I said, money first. Hmm. And I separated how I make money and how I teach. And I said, I'm a money guy by societal choice. And my cosmic choice is to be a teacher. And I separated the two. So I said, money nice. first. And so I'm rich, regardless right. that my book sells or not. Regardless that my book changes the world or not today, mm -hmm. or in 600 years when I'm dead, mm -hmm. I will have lived a great experience of my own time here now and won't have to dwell in my own agony. Mm -hmm. While a thousand years later, someone picks up this book and goes, yeah. "Great way to I look. wish people would have read this you know, yeah, a thousand yeah. years ago. I wish yeah. someone would have known the, the personality or the person. It doesn't matter to me mm -hmm. because my experience holds just as much weight as others, which is why I never believe you should help others until you've helped yourself first. I, I agree with that. Right. How can you fill someone else's cup when <laughs> exactly. your cup is half yeah. empty, right? Exactly. Oh, good stuff. Well, PJ, really thank you for your time. I think this was a lot of good conversation. Hopefully people open their minds to whatever they're seeing here today and are at least are willing to investigate for themselves. Don't mm -hmm. look for reviews of what others say of things investigate for yourself learn for yourself you know it doesn't matter yeah. if someone thinks a movie's great or not watch it for yourself and, and if it's in if it interests you don't be blocked by the opinion of others i mean a review system in itself is the mm -hmm. epitome of like everything wrong with society like, everybody has an opinion yeah we, we want how much to, is it worth and, though and it's you know? not always relevant to ours someone could say mm -hmm. this is the worst book they've ever read because they're unconscious and they're unaware based and on their own perception right and, and they go I just believe in God and nothing he's saying makes sense to me, yeah. you know? So that's why you can't let that become the driver for why you can't progress, you know? And so I think it's important to understand what others have to say, but it's even more important to experience for yourself, you know? At the end of the day, you know, I think this really sets you apart from the rest of the Correct. everybody out there, you mm -hmm. know, because they don't have that consciousness, Correct. nor are they evaluating what is Correct. happening to themselves to even, you know, <laughs> embark on such a journey. Yep. PJ, thank you so much for your time. Yeah,